thank you for uh, sticking around, and um, we're going to talk a little bit, then do a QA. and a Does everybody want to introduce themselves? I'm Daniel Fabello, by the way. I uh, help uh, produce some of these docs, and... Um, and yeah, that's that's about it. That's a great <laughs> introduction, Daniel. <laughs> Thank, thanks, Gus. Uh, I'm Matt Hames, and I'm the director of Unconventional, and I've directed five other RT docs besides this one, starting with Connected. And I'm Gus. I used to work at Rich Cheese, but I'm, I'm a professional Abraham Lincoln impersonator now. <laughs> Presenter. Presenter. Sorry. Presenter. That's right. That's the important part. <clears throat> I'm Doreen Copeland. I am the supervising producer um, with live action at Rooster Teeth. So uh, I have the uh, first question, Gus. Was the fat suit worth it? It was because simply because it was really Doreen. Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> it was actually really cold when we were walking around the streets uh, in New York for SantaCon, and the reason I got the fat suit was to try to help insulate my body heat even more. <laughs> that being said, it was really, like we touched on it there, it was really difficult to get in and out of it. So I was very conscious about how much I was drinking throughout the day because I did not want to have to go to the bathroom. And at one point I did have to go to the bathroom. Uh, the first bar we went to, which was up on the roof, and the men's room was just, there was a wall of urinals and then like a walkway behind it so people could get to the stalls and whatnot the width of that room was maybe a little more than this table. So I had to walk up to a urinal, get out of my Santa suit, get out of my fat suit, get out of my thermal underwear to use the urinal while there's people like brushing up against <laughs> me, pushing my Santa suit into the urinal. Uh, it, was, it was pretty frightening. Did we return the Santa suit? <laughs> I Santa still have it. <laughs> Santa suit was clean. Yeah, you didn't want to see the floor in that bar either. It was not, not pretty. The idea of the suit touching the floor and then being put back on you is kind of sketchy. There's a lot of grossness. <laughs> so I th I'm pretty sure Gus has actually been in every single RT doc. And in some capacity, interviewing you for Let's Play Live or as a founding father. Yeah, I have. Um, or just, you know, people bouncing you know, asking you to get tattoos or give a tattoo. But um, I was wondering what it's like for you now to be a subject of one. And, you know, was it, do you feel like, uh, was this the first time you saw it all the way through? Or no, no, I watched it when you, you it before. before it came out. Um, but do you feel like it was a fair representation? And do you feel like it was, it was fun to have the spotlight just put on you? I like the spotlight on me. So yeah, <laughs> absolutely. No, I thought it. I thought it was really good. It was a lot of fun to uh, go to the different events, and I intentionally, um, I like we, you know, kept getting hammered home in the documentary. Like I'm a very normally a very solitary person. I don't like to go out of my way to to talk to strangers. So I kept having to push myself outside of my comfort zone to try to do things. Like probably my biggest nightmare ever was having to approach one of those domes on the roof at SantaCon and then interject myself into a group of friends. Imagine if you were out with all of your friends in this dome and this asshole walks in with a film crew and it's like, hey guys, what's up? Let's talk. That's Gus Sirola from Rooster Teeth. No, uh, no one cares at all. <laughs> it's all like drunk people from Long Island and Jersey, you know, who've been drinking since six in the morning. <laughs> um, so it was it was interesting from that perspective, just to try to push myself outside of things that I'm normally very comfortable with. Which I, I I'm curious because I'm sure a lot of people can relate. It's like how how is it that you are such a self proclaimed hermit, but you are really good at talking to people? It's practice. Is that it's, it? It's like there was who who was it? It was I believe Fred Armisen's ex wife once gave the most biting critique ever of him. And I, I think about it a lot. Like I th I'm afraid that it applies to me sometimes. And she said that his greatest impersonation ever is that of a normal human being. <laughs> and uh, it's like, you know, <laughs> if you watch the way people interact enough, you can start to like figure out how to emulate it. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll take notes. Uh, <laughs> Um, I guess, and I'm also curious, Matt, having worked on so many RT docs, how has it been working, like, working within the, the company now for a while, like, finding out new things, but then, and like, and now you've, like, you've 
met with Gus each time, but now you've like focused on him. What's what's that process like, and how interesting or scary? Well, I, you know, I guess I was a little um, surprised that Gus let us film in his house, given that uh, you know how he is, uh, I, how I came to find out that he was. No one's ever been to my house. Yeah, I was. I felt honored, um, and uh, you know, it's just it's always better with a documentary if you can sort of get in that person's environment and that, that person's world and really kind of know who they are. And so shooting Gus in meeting rooms at Rooster Teeth is, you know, may, maybe somewhat interesting, but not as interesting as like really getting to know the real him. And that's kind of what we try to do with all of the docs is like with the tattooist, with Jeff, like try to sort of get to know them in a, in a different way. And I think part of it, in a way, it's good that I'm kind of outside the Rooster Teeth world because what we do, like our, production company we do documentaries you just do nonfiction film and so the things that I'm really used to, to doing are just trying to bring people out of their shell and um, and just kind of dig in and uh, and so over time you know realizing that cer certain people at Rooster Teeth you don't really need to do that very much and then certain people you do so I'm glad that you came and actually filmed in my house because uh, I was reading through the comments on the Rooster Teeth website and uh, someone left a comment that said, Gus, why do you keep your coffee grinder on the top shelf? Why don't you put it somewhere it's easier to get to? And I said, I, I replied, like, I never thought about it being <laughs> difficult to get to. But now that you say that, I'm going to think about that every time I reach for it. Like, I need to put it somewhere else. <laughs> first shelf, Gus, first shelf, rookie mistake. Um, so I remember that the, uh, I think the inception of this, this is a question for the whole panel, the inception of this doc was, well over a year ago, I believe, like we got a paragraph pitch from one of our internal producers, and um, we ch we were everybody immediately thought that Gus would be the the best subject to take us through these cons. But um, what was the brainstorming process? I know there was um, Matt. Were you talking to Gus about that? Like, what what was that process like of uh, just getting started? Yeah, at Alpheus, we um, we kind of did some research and put together a big list of conventions. And then basically, like, I think I just shared that list with you, and Gus reacted um, and decided where he wanted to go. And that's kind of kind of how it worked out. Yeah, it's kind of, and I think you recorded it, and that VO is me reading the list of conventions that's actually in the final doc, was mm -hmm. when you gave it to me and you said, these are the docs, these are the conventions we're thinking about going to. Mm -hmm. And it was just me reading them and saying, oh, yeah, that one sounds good, this one sounds bad, I do not... <laughs> there were some I definitely did not want to go to. And uh, I think one of them was a cruise. <laughs> or like, I was like, I said, I very flatly said, like, I'm not going to any convention on a boat. Like, you can't get off. Right, that was the thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I said, once you're on a boat, you are stuck there and you have to do the entire thing. A brony convention on a cruise would be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> not for Gus. No. A, uh, even a Star Trek convention or anything? No, no, no. Star Trek convention is fine, just not on a boat. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. Uh, were there any that you or any anyone up here that we wanted to really go to but couldn't for whatever reason? Or I kept not? kind of Thailand. Was it Thailand? Yeah, we can't go to Thailand. It's too far away. We kept uh, trying to convince Doreen that it was a good idea to go to a clown convention in Thailand. <laughs> Because it just seems so weird. It's like the World Clown Association has their convention in Bangkok. Yeah. I, so we, I kept trying to convince Doreen to let us go to Bangkok to, to film a, a convention there. Couldn't do it. Sorry. Yeah, we also talked about the ventriloquist convention, um, which I think we were pretty serious about doing. And, and that would really be an interesting convention, I think. Um, ultimately, the furries convention was being in Texas, and it being furries, it was, it was kind of the, the third choice to go to. Um, but I still want to go to a ventriloquism convention. I'd love to see, like Bernie said, like how do they communicate with each other? What's the keynote like? All that kind of stuff. Who do you look at? Do you make eye contact with the dummy or the person? You see, these are the questions we need answered. Yeah. <laughs> Doreen, I think we're going to have to go to a ventriloquist convention now. No, no. I, the interviews would be weird. <laughs> you know, like, just... I think, actually, yeah. the, the, we need someone at RT to learn that skill and then go and interview people with a dummy. It could be the follow-up to the tattooist, the ventriloquist. <laughs> the ventriloquist. <laughs> but, but who would we send? Like. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to think about it. Oh, wait, I think John Reisinger might make sense since there's Puppet John. 
There's Puppet John? Yeah. We have Puppet John who did uh, On the Spot. Okay, well, there You've we never go. Been, he's very nice. The ventriloquist with Puppet John. <laughs> <laughs> so, so about these specific conventions that you all went to, um, did, do you think... Uh, the I thought it was kind of surprising that at the Lincoln convention that they pretty much iced you out for the first half of the day. It, seemed it was like more than the first half. For, okay, <laughs> so most of the day. But do you f have you ever had that experience at any other... Con like, do other conventions do that? Or was it just because it was kind of small and it was just they all knew each other? Like, what, what do you think led to that? Does that happen elsewhere? I think, you know, it was definitely the fact that it was a small group uh, was a huge factor in that. I think also may maybe people have tried to crash it before uh, as an impersonator. Like that one scene where the guy's asking me, he says he doesn't recognize me. That went on a lot longer than you showed in that documentary. That was a long exchange where mm -hmm. I had to like drop names and like convince the guy that I really legitimately belonged there. <laughs> and I didn't know you guys were filming during that. No one came in to save me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we legitimately registered for the convention, so I don't know why he didn't know. Maybe Susan didn't pass that along. Maybe. I don't know. Do, do, Matt, do, that's a good point, but Matt, have, do you ever, is there ever a time where you want to jump in and save your subject in times that you absolutely abandon them? Yeah, all the time. I mean, I'm not a monster. <laughs> uh, I feel, I do, sometimes feel really bad when something like that's happening, and then in the same time, in the back of my mind, I'm going, I know this is really going to be good for the doc. <laughs> but... Um, but yeah, I felt like Gus held his own really well at, at the Lincoln Impersonators or Presenters Convention. Presenters. Sorry. Um, <laughs> the, um, I mean, they were a little on the fence, I think, about letting us come. I mean, Audrey Long, who's our producer here, she uh, communicated with the organizer um, and you know, kind of tried to convince her to let us come. And then we had a phone call, I remember, with her, uh, with the organizer. And I think, I'm not sure if she really knew who Rooster Teeth was. And I think that might have helped uh, kind of Get us, get us there. I don't think that she was like, now what is this website that's going to be on Rooster Teeth? Okay, all right. And uh, and then I don't know how much they vetted that after that. But I don't uh, think they did. Yeah, <laughs> I really. <laughs> they didn't. Look. It was Audrey who described the hotel as being old. Yeah. <laughs> by the way. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Go ahead. Well, uh, yeah, and then I guess do you guess was it? Do. You, <laughs> yes. Is Lincoln now is did did that have any effect on your views of Lincoln or is he your fa do you have a favorite president now? Uh, I don't think I have a favorite president. If, if I had a favorite president it's going to be an unpopular choice like Andrew Jackson. Oh, that's a terrible choice. <laughs> Just because it's like there's a different time, man. Like he beat people with a cane. His parrot was ejected from his funeral cuz it was cursing too much. Like <laughs> like that's a personality. <laughs> Um, terrible guy, terrible <laughs> human being. <laughs> terrible. But it's like that. Like it, you remember that. You like that's memorable, right? That stands out. But uh, no, I mean it didn't have any effect on my thoughts of Lincoln. Other than now, anytime I see a Lincoln vehicle, I'm gonna think about Abraham Lincoln. I never made that connection in my head before. Yeah. One thing I learned was that Kentucky did not secede. Uh, is anyone here from Kentucky, by the way? No. Okay. You talk about Kentucky. They did not. <laughs> they didn't secede, and for some reason, I had thought they did. That shows you how historically illiterate I am. But they all knew when Texas seceded. Uh, they all immediately just kind of like talked about Sam Houston and Texas. So. Well, we found out also that the day we went and the day we were filming at the Capitol was the anniversary of the Battle of San Jacinto mm -hmm. in Texas, and everyone there knew that. And none of our crew did. We did I didn't know. <laughs> I'm familiar with the battle, but I didn't know it was it was like th that day, mm -hmm. and everyone there knew. They were all super into history. It was amazing. Yeah. So um, the furry con uh, that we we were I think internally a little bit hesitant because furries are not not because they're misunderstood necessarily, but because they're probably oversaturated in the in just everybody's knowledge or, you know, there's been other docs about them. But what did you all discover? It's, in, it's you cover it pretty well, but like, was there anything that wasn't in the doc that you discovered that you found interesting or was it more awkward than it seems to go? I know going to the hotel room was kind of weird. <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was a little weird. Um, the strangest thing to me and what led to me asking about the different types of furries was the fact that I kept seeing people wearing shirts that said hoofs, not woofs. And I really wanted to dive into, is there 
interspecies conflict within the furry community. <laughs> and uh, I asked KP a couple of times trying to see if I get an answer out of him. And he kept saying, no, it was always only friendly ribbing and that there's really no hierarchy amongst furries. But like, I, st I still don't believe him. <laughs> like, I still want to know what the pecking order of the different species of fursuits are. Yeah. And I, I saw some comments on the, on the Rooster Teeth site that some of the data that was presented in there may have been like, as far as like, the male versus female ratio, there's probably more women than he says. Is that true? Do you know if, or what, did you witness, was it a predominantly male when you were there? Uh, it's, it's hard, again, it's hard to say because when someone is first suiting, you don't really necessarily yeah, know, yeah. um, you know who's under the suit. People who weren't in first suit, I think his numbers held up. Yeah. It, it seemed like it to me at least. Yeah. Yeah, it seemed more male to me, but there were a lot of women and a lot of kids there too. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think to me the biggest thing, and it's kind of been covered in the in the doc, but I, I was not expecting it to be so welcoming and friendly. I thought it might feel a little bit more weird, and it actually, and I don't know if that says something about me that I didn't think it was weird, but I just it, it wasn't that weird. I mean, it was, you know, everybody was really nice, having a good time, and. Um, very friendly and very open and willing. And I think that, you know, Gus had a reluctance to get a furry suit on or, or a fur suit on because not really sure if that of the connotations. And also, like, we weren't really sure if he should just go drop into a furry convention and just, like, put a fur suit on because it's kind of like crashing someone else's party. Like, these people really seriously do this and then just kind of showing up and acting like you can just do it right in that day. Um, seemed a little uh, disrespectful, but then actually KP said, no, that wouldn't have been disrespectful at all. I think he really wanted you to get into a fursuit, actually. Yeah, <laughs> maybe for the sequel. <laughs> uh, did, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think you covered this, but uh, is there an animal that you would dress up, like what would be the animal Again, that you dress we, up We as? talked about this quite a bit. <laughs> like I wasn't sure what the potential implications, again, I'm hung up on species. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that says something about me, but I wasn't sure what the different implication of the different type of suit meant. Uh, <laughs> if there was no judgment across any of them, uh, if I had to pick one, I'd probably pick a fox. Fox. That, I, <laughs> that's a great choice, Gus. <laughs> you, you, <laughs> correct. <laughs> Good answer. <Yeah. laughs> um, and then was there, uh, kind of jumping back to the uh, Santa Con, was... Uh, was there anything, do, do you feel like you needed to be more drunk to really enjoy that? Was there anything disappointing, like were you, or actually, actually even better was like um, going down to Kyle. How was, of the four things, the four kind of cons that you did, was that almost, was that the most awkward for you, Gus? Or no. where did that go on the scale? That was not awkward at all compared to some of the other things. Um, the, the Kyle stuff was really endearing in a like apple pie Americana kind of way, uh, but I did crack up when that kid got hit in the face with the candy. <laughs> that was the funniest thing in the world to me. <laughs> but uh, it was really endearing. Uh, like that Santa was absolutely amazing. Like all of the toys he gave away, he paid for himself. Like it wasn't like donations or anything. Like he took his own money and went and bought toys and made sure he had toy for every uh, child who came up. And I guess like he had, he had like a long uh, story, I can't get into all of it here, about why he did it. And it was really uh, amazing to listen to him talk about why he did it and his motivation behind it and like how he would sit there all night until he talked to every kid who would come out to see Santa Claus. It was absolutely incredible. So we actually have a deleted scene that we wanna show for you going to New York after Kyle. I'm and dying to see this. we can stream this, right? Yeah, we can, we can I, I think we can. We can go ahead and stream this one. If I can play it back correctly. That first driver that morning was so happy to see us. I know, <laughs> it was amazing. Yeah, it was really weird. Yeah. Uh, how excited she was about SantaCon, considering how many people we talked to who were like, ah, SantaCon, all those yeah. drunks. Yeah. Yeah, the locals really didn't seem to like it at all, but that Uber driver did. She seemed excited about it. Yeah, and uh, we tried to, for a long time, to get more people to talk negatively about SantaCon with us. Mm -hmm. But it was, uh, it was really difficult because the people who don't like SantaCon also don't like talking on camera. Right. 
and they don't like talking on camera to people dressed in Santa suits. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think we're going to open up for Q&A, so if you can uh, go ahead and go to the mics, and uh, feel free to ask questions about this documentary or any of the RT docs in general, and we'll try to answer them. I feel free to ask Doreen repeatedly why she didn't let me go to Thailand. <laughs> Okay, let's start over there. Uh, Gus, I gotta ask, what are the chances uh, we are gonna see another one of those costumes sometime on the RT like podcast or something like that again? It's funny, I didn't think about it till Thursday. I was just telling Matt this backstage. I didn't think about it till Thursday, but we still had like the Lincoln costume. Like I should have brought it out and dressed as Lincoln for RTX. <laughs> but uh, so you would have been cosplaying as yourself, cosplaying as, as me, cosplaying as Lincoln. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so yeah, uh, uh, maybe, we'll see. Maybe for unconventional too. I think that top hat is still in Kentucky though, that, isn't it? That top hat did not make it back. I couldn't fit it into my luggage uh, to come back, so I had to leave it uh, in the hotel. The Clarion Hotel now has a nice hat. It was ridiculously huge. <laughs> okay, we're here. Uh, yeah, and the documentary shows you just going from convention to convention to convention, but was it spread out more, or did you just have the most interesting week in the world? It would have been cool if it was all a week. Um, the problem with events is they're not conveniently timed for filming. So okay. it, was, it was spread out over several months. I think SantaCon was in December. Uh, Lincoln was in April. March or April. March or April. And then Furry was actually right around the same time as yeah. Lincoln by like a couple of weeks off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks. But it was weird to start the documentary in December mm -hmm. and then like kind of put it away mm -hmm. and not think about it for several months and then come back to it you know, in the in the spring. Yeah, it was kind of a different pace. Like the last doc that, that I directed, House of Pain, was, you know, a brutal week, brutal for James and Lawrence and also brutal for the crew. And this was a little bit nicer because it was kind of more spread out over time. Okay. So um, how do you like kind of decide what documentaries you're gonna do? Because some seem more like organic, like Let's Play Live, like, yeah, we'd love to see like the behind the scenes for that, but for things like the tattooist or the unconventional or even connected, like how do you guys kind of go through the process? Like we have this idea and it evolves into a full documentary. It's a good question. Um, I can speak a little bit to that. I th it's a constant brainstorming throughout the year. Um, and a lot of times we'll have an entire list of ideas that we wanna do um, for the year and we will just start develop thing, developing them a little by little and then finding out which ones kind of float to the top and make the most amount of sense. And also scheduling is a big thing as well. It drives a lot of what we can and can't do. And part of it is also uh, talking to um, employees and the different personalities we have at the company and seeing what they're interested in or what the community might be interested in. So. You know, that's why I think it's interesting to see what Jeff feels about tattoos or having Gus goes going to the, all those conventions. It's something that they're passionate about and that they can we can follow them as they experience it. So that that's definitely part of it as well. Sure. Yeah. Um, and actually, if you all, as you ask questions, if you have ideas, well, you know, <laughs> what you'd be interested in seeing, please let us know. Okay, over here. Not nearly close enough. Can you hear me? Yeah, it, yeah, we it's, hear. it's working. Yep. All right. Oh. <laughs> go, go ahead. You're good. You're good. <laughs> so, speaking of fandoms, I uh, I consider myself a professional fanfic writer. I'm wondering what Rooster Teeth's policy is on recommending fanfiction of their work to Rooster Teeth employees who can hear these recommendations who should not for legal reasons how to recommend to people, you know, that sort of thing. Gus? <laughs> I mean, just contact through social media. That's the, the easiest way to do it. That's it? No, don't talk to the writers? Nothing? Well, I don't know why you wouldn't talk to the writers. No? It seems totally fine. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> hey. 
in what year did Texas become the 11th? No, just kidding. Um, <laughs> it was 1863, I think. They told me repeatedly. It, that was that was right. Fun. Yeah. Real question. Um, so it sounds like the um, the nexus of this, or the origin, I should say, of this documentary came through some brainstorming session of looking up cons prior to this. And then it sounds like you were selected just because of your, you know, well-documented hermit-like tendencies. Um, ha ha, it was really funny. I'm curious though, if you had to choose what you wanted to do as an RT doc, uh, Gus, what would you have done rather than put yourself in a crowd of people? This is actually one that I championed from pretty early on. Uh, I found out about it pretty, I think, like when it was, the idea first came up. And I think I tweeted that, I wanted to call it confluence because <laughs> I thought it was like people coming together and the influence and all of that convention influence because uh, I thought maybe unconventional painted it in like a weird light and I thought but the problem is confluence isn't a word that people necessarily know it's not like a an easily accessible word but this is the one that I wanted to do is this there is a the reason one that you wanted to put yourself in that position I like events uh, having organized RTX for many years and having gone to many different events, I, I again, going back to my earlier weirdo answer, I like observing people and seeing how people interact. And I thought that this was a good way to see how people who are passionate about things interacted and communicated about those things. And the most interesting one, and I think they used the line in, in the documentary, was uh, the furries who didn't care that there was a negative stigma, or they didn't care what other people thought about it. They just wanted to have fun, and they were going to do their thing, and whatever. And uh, I thought that was really that was really interesting. Loving the docs. Thank you. Keep them coming. Thanks. Yeah, sure. Hi. You can, you can applaud for that. <laughs> Over here. Do you guys actually want to know why the Lincolns froze you out? Why what? Why? <laughs> Your clothing. I watched it on a tablet and I could tell that you hadn't researched. I could tell that it was a costume. Uh, these people researched the history down to uh, fabric content, number of stitches per inch. If it was done by hand, yeah. it, would be do, in, it would be done by hand. In fact, I don't know if y'all were filming at the time, but we t I talked about costumes with one of the Lincolns. I think it was at the Lincoln dealership. And he was telling me how not only did he have costumes for each year of Lincoln's life, but he had it for different seasons within those years, uh, going throughout all of Lincoln's life. And he had, I think, I want to say like 30 different Lincoln outfits, depending on what was the appropriate time. And I think you are absolutely correct. This, like, all that attention to detail, they really focus on that. I grew up in that culture. Um, my wedding was set in 1863. And cool. I did not wear a chemise, so under your corset, that would have come from 1864. It is an incredibly intense scrutiny. Mm -hmm. wow. And you well, stepped onto the big playing field. What was <laughs> interesting also is this was another conversation that I had at the Lincoln dealership that didn't make it into the documentary, but it might have been the same guy I was talking to about the different outfits, and I was asking him, like, oh, do... Do, does everyone really place a big importance on uh, the costume and how everyone looks? And he, he was kind of, he was really dismissive of the question. Uh, he, I forget his exact words. He said, like, no, no, it's okay. We don't care. It, no, what I, I remember what I asked. I asked, is there a competition for who has the most authentic Lincoln uh, outfit? And he said, no, no, we don't care about what our outfits look like. We're not like those Mary Lincolns. Mm. <laughs> and I, tried to, I started to try to ask him more about that, but it's right when we started getting called outside to go take the group photo outside, so I didn't get uh, any follow-up on that question. Yeah. Huh. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for your question. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Over here. Hello. Um, how did you all prepare for these cons and, like, the interactions that you had with the people there, but, like, specifically, like, overcoming the fear of them seeing you as like making fun of them. And I, to just add on to that, how much is the groundwork, how much of it is the groundwork on the docs, doc team side setting up an interview and how much of it is like Gus going through and trying to find someone to, to interview? 
Well, that, that's an interesting question because on the other docs, I typically, I do all the interviews. And on this one, you know, Gus obviously doing the podcast and, and all the stuff that he's always done for Rooster Teeth, he's a very curious person. And, um, and so we didn't really have to do anything. Like the shoot, we just kind of let Gus take the lead um, and talk to people. But in terms of setting up the shoot, there was a lot of legwork that had to be done. Um, again, Audrey um, making phone calls and, and me making phone calls and just talking to people on the phone and explaining to them we are not there to make fun of them. You know, we are we, we have a track record of doing serious documentaries and we're not just trying to like make light of this situation. And um, you know, in some cases we got the door kind of closed on us, and in other cases. They were they were open to it, but usually you have to talk to them on the phone first um, before they'll they especially with furries. I remember furries was um, they were they were pretty I think reluctant initially to let us uh, film there at all until we wrote this really like long kind of pleading email explaining how we were going to frame things and what we were interested in finding out about, and then they then they were open. But then yeah, once we were there, Gus. Is is great at just walking up to people and talking to people, even if it's even if he's like dying inside while he's doing it. <laughs> there were a few moments where you all identified people that you thought I should talk to, like at the Lincoln presenters. You found that woman who her and her husband had made the book about conventions, yeah, because you had overheard her explain to someone why it was a convention, yeah, uh, and by the the strict definition. Yeah, that Mary Lincoln was kind of she was summarizing the entire point of this documentary, and I just overheard her talking about it, so it was pretty amazing. And then Gus sat and talked to her. She's the one that said the Furbies, talked about the Furbies. <laughs> awesome, thank you. Over here. Uh, yeah, I have a, uh, just like a recommendation for a documentary. I've noticed how, like, the House of Pain documentary and the Tattooist documentary, they've been focusing on the, the interests and hobbies of Rooster Teeth employees, and I know that uh, Aaron Marquis is quite quite knowledgeable on cars and he he's a big gearhead and stuff and I was wondering if you'd ever do a documentary on car culture and you know like why us car nuts I'm one of them like we go to track days every weekend we can and it it's a really interesting subject and it's uh, I think it would be a, make a pretty good documentary uh, also cool. from what we saw of your house gush you have a beautiful home <laughs> thank you <laughs> that's all Esther <laughs> That, that seems interesting. I think and my takeaway from that suggestion is definitely uh, focusing maybe on more like specific geeky things that, that people have interest in maybe. Yeah, yeah, it's a cool idea. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Over here. Hey, hey guys, uh, I was wondering if the RT Docs crew would consider um, pursuing documentaries that are more maybe investigative and like hard hitting um, you know, in involving maybe topics that aren't like pertinent to uh, Rooster Teeth or like their employees or whatever. I'll take that one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I think uh, it's definitely on our minds. Like that. That that's um, something we're exploring, um, and even doing bigger documentaries. But also, one thing we have to consider is just timing. Of like, you know, we want to make sure that we're having a certain amount of documentaries coming out every year, and so sometimes those investigative things you're talking about can take months or years to be able to follow a person or a, what, whatever the subject is. So it's part of, part of the challenge with doing something like that would be just the, the schedule, but it's, I don't think it's off the table. Um, and it would, it would, it would, we'd have to find something that we're really passionate about. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't. Uh, we sh we should all have a brainstorming session on that as well. Yeah, the I don't know if you saw the doc, the meme machine, uh, back in December, but that was a little more veering towards that kind of an investigative, historical piece, uh, looking at a, a big sweeping story of how something developed. Um, and you know, I think the uh, the idea is that we want to keep a variety, like have a nice variety of different types of docs, and so. In a way, if you look at all the docs, at least that I've been involved in, they've all been pretty different. Um, and I think it's trying to just keep everything fresh and make a diversity of different types of stories. You know, House of Pain is like a real-time kind of sports doc. Uh, this is obviously totally different. Me Machine is different. Connected is different. So um, yeah, I think it's I think it's all worth pursuing. 
Thank you. Thanks. Over here. Okay. Um, you guys, you know, talk about the history of Rooster Teeth, you know, at panels and stuff, but have you talked about doing a, a serious doc about the history and growth of Rooster Teeth, maybe with Matt over there at the forefront of the doc? We, we, there actually have been a, uh, one or two documentaries made like that already. I think the most recent one was probably, was it 2013 uh, or so? Um, uh, I think it was Machinima made one that they that they released uh, on their YouTube channel that talked about the origins and the growth of Rooster Teeth. Maybe at some point we can revisit it as uh, in a bigger retrospective. But uh, they, they do exist if you look for them. There are a few out there. Okay. It's tough to make a documentary about yourself because you feel like you're just patting yourself on the back. Like, look how great we are and how big we are. Um, so we that's a, a very fine line to walk. And I, we haven't figured out how to navigate that yet. Okay, and then I had a question. You mentioned uh, Confluence. What other names did you workshop for this doc? Oh, it was and only Confluence. I was oh, no, there the was Con Man. It was Con originally Man. pitched yeah. as Con Man. <laughs> well, again, that has like a negative connotation to it. <laughs> I liked it. It was my favorite. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Over here. Hi. Um, I was just wondering with like the growth of conventions and especially like pop or pop culture conventions, how do you see conventions changing from the large ones such as like San Diego or Anime Expo to the smaller niche ones? Yeah, I think it's it's really an interesting thing where just about anyone can have a convention nowadays. You know, you, even if you think about the origins of San Diego Comic Con, like that's an event that's been around forever that started super small, just like a couple of people getting together to talk about comic books and uh, watching it grow and rise. And I joke about it a lot, but I, in the back of my mind, I think that it could potentially happen where the creation of conventions could become an outsourced ad hoc thing where you could almost export your assets and export some templates and say, just make your own convention. Like we could send people, make your own, host your own RTX packs and uh, you could have your own small get together in your town, um, officially if you wanted to, or unofficially if you wanted to as well. I mean, these RTX started because of fan conventions and because of people holding their own smaller conventions. And I think that uh, we're just gonna continue to see that distribute more and more. Uh, follow up question, have you heard about DashCon? Yes, and, okay. absolutely. Because <laughs> that's what I think of with like you get five minutes failed. in the ball pit. A failed <laughs> convention. Okay, we've got time for one or two more. Okay, um, when you do a documentary, you're trying to kind of tell a story and you want to get people to view the story that you've done. Uh, with Rooster Teeth, they're behind the first wall. <laughs> Is there kind of like a specific reason behind that? Because I feel that you're limiting the number of people that can actually get to see your documentary. And I feel that that sometimes just seems slightly weird to me because you're trying to tell a story kind of about things. Well, we're still telling the story, and people are still watching it. It's just uh, whether how much uh, skin in the game they're willing to put into it to see it. And, I mean, honestly, what we always tell people is there's a 30-day free trial for first. <laughs> Anyone can go in and check it out and see if they wanted to. Like, those, every documentary that you've made and that we've, that we've produced and talked about is available there, you know, and I think it's a good value for our first members. And it's, it's intriguing enough. They are intriguing enough of topics that they can draw people in and, and want to join and be part of it. Also, the, at the movie theater, you have to pay to watch the movie. It's, you're just paying to see a story told. I mean, it's the, I think it's the same concept. Mm -hmm. Okay, Cheers. last question over here. Thank you. Hello. Um, I'm a filmmaker as well. I'm working on a documentary right now, actually. Um, and I love the stuff that you guys make documentaries about. I think they're all so interesting. Um, I know that you obviously outsource a lot of your work to Alpheus Media, and I think that's really cool, but um, would you ever want to move um, the docs department more in-house, or would, would you want to keep doing it through Alpheus Media? I'm well, glad I'm she brought this up, Matt. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's about to get awkward. This entire, <laughs> entire um, thing is an elaborate um, way to fire me. Yeah. <laughs> in front of a lot of Sorry. people. Sorry. news. <laughs> no, it's a good question. I, uh, we enjoy working with Alpheus, <clears throat> excuse me, and I think they have a wonderful voice that they bring to the table to um, to help us explore docs and help us explore docs that include um, our folks from from Rooster Teeth without it feeling kind of weird 
Like when you, like I said, when you explore yourself or talk about yourself, it seems sort of uh, self-congratulatory. But I do think there is a time coming down the road when we will also um, lean on some of our, our creative folks in-house to help us tell more stories. And I think it will always be a, it will be a balance too, even if we did, you know, go more inward because if if I were to do another one, I'd probably lean on the Alpheus team to help me do that because they have so much producing experience. So it's, it's one of those things of, um, it does take a certain talent to tell documentaries that and and tell narrative and an ability if if a certain talent to tell both you know so I think that's uh that's what they bring to the table. Thank you. Thank thank all of you. Thank, there, thank you for coming. Would you want to oh. let, let her ask her question? Yeah. yeah. Okay. One more question. <laughs> Like, what's your favorite colors? <laughs> I always tend to lean more towards blues and grays. Uh, I'm sure you saw I was wearing a lot of that in the documentary. I'm wearing the exact opposite of that right now for some reason. <laughs> uh, my favorite color is green. Yeah. Um, my favorite color is probably gray. <laughs> and I love blue. Is it okay if I ask two questions? Go yeah. for it. <laughs> Do you want to do like sort of a sequel to that? Because I sort of want to see you do the Mermaid Con. <laughs> well, what's, I would love to, but what's really weird to me is that this con this documentary came out uh, on June thirtieth, and I watched it. And that night on Nightline, which is a, a nighttime news program, they had a story about that mermaid convention. Oh, they did? <laughs> so I thought it was really awkward timing that they did it. And I, after I watched the Nightline story, I'm glad we didn't go to the Mermaid Convention. <laughs> it, it, it sounds a lot better in your head than what it actually is uh, in person. <laughs> but yes, I would love to do another one. Can I say one more? Okay. Sure, sure. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Um, one more, one more quick thing. I just wanted to point out uh, Katrina Devira and Jackie Kensler uh, and Audrey Long and Beth Hames, all of here who are in the audience and worked on the film, and and Melinda Bonifay and Brian Nelligan. Y'all should I think stand all, up. Yeah, all you guys stand up if you don't mind. Yeah, and Alex Herrera. Cool. So that's the end of RTX. Uh, <laughs> thank you, everyone, for coming out this year. Uh, hopefully, we'll see you guys in 2018 or London or Sydney. Yeah. So uh, thank you so much for spending your weekend with us. It was a blast to see all of you guys. Thanks, everybody. Thank